So I'd now like to hand over to Company Watch. I think it was going to be Adam first. I'm not sure whether it's going to be Adam. Uh, yes, no. It is. Okay. <laughs> so I'd like to hand over to Dr. Adam Tucker, who can take you through the rise of alternative data in credit risk. Over to you. Okay. Thanks very much, Laurie. Um, yeah. So as I said, so we're here to talk about uh, the rise of alternative data in credit risk. Um, uh, okay. But just to summarize um, the structure of what we're going to talk about first. Okay. So initially we're just going to go through um, kind of traditional credit scoring, um, financial ratios, what people do with, with kind of current, more traditional financial data. And then we'll move on to the alternative data. So asking questions like, what is alternative data and why are people using it now? And when we go into that, we'll, we'll briefly touch upon um, things um, that, that are happening with technology, like um, people using um, having more access to compute and data storage now, and also a bit about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, and then um, we'll talk about what the different types of alternative data are um, that are available for, for using in um, corporate credit risk um, models. And then finally, we'll go through a couple of applications um, that we've been working on using alternative data um, at Company Watch. So um, to start off, um, so credit risk models um, for companies um, have had their roots in, um, in, in ratio analysis, basically as long as financial statements have, be, have been available. So um, Benjamin Graham first published this book in 1949, where he looked at the current ratio and the ratio of debt to current assets to evaluate companies' health. Um, that was mainly to do with picking um, undervalued stocks in, in the investment market, but also applies to um, companies' house uh, with credit. So what are the ratios that people kind of look at generally? Um, there's profitability ratios. Normally, these are one of the biggest indicators of, of financial strength. Um, given that half of US publicly listed companies are, are loss making. Um, there's liquidity ratios, so things like I mentioned before, the current ratio and the asset te test ratio, things that could cause a cash flow crisis in the short term. And then there's things like creditor days and debtor days, so how quickly does a company pay its pay the people it owes money to, or how quickly does it get paid? And then things like return on equity, so how efficient is a company at converting its equity to profit? So... Um, that, that's financial ratios. How are these things combined? Well, in 1967, um, a guy called Ed Altman um, came up with what's known as um, the Z score. And this was using a statistical learning technique called linear discriminant analysis to put together the financial ratios. And this is when people really started looking at could they look at the pattern recognition of um, companies that have previously failed and work out what, what the features of those were in comparison to companies that hadn't failed. And he's, he had a very simple and easily uh, interpretable formula based on five financial ratios. And originally he was looking at uh, a sample of around 66 industrial companies. So very small kind of sample com in comparison to um, what people talk about with data um, these days. People still use the Z-score as a kind of yardstick measure, and it's available on things like Bloomberg today. Okay, so that brings us on to, to Company Watch's kind of um, measurement of financial strength coming from kind of traditional financial accounts. Um, we have something called the H-score, which is a bit like the Z-score. It still uses discriminant analysis. But instead of using kind of the bare... Um, financial ratios that I touched upon in the, in the first slide. Um, it uses, it transforms the data and we build, actually build a suite of, of models looking at different types of companies based on their balance sheet. So um, maybe a services company um, would have a lot different um, looking balance sheet to maybe a retail company 
they might have much more um, inventory on their balance sheet. So we would deal with those kind of companies differently. Um, and we put all of those together into one kind of composite model and we output a score between zero and 100. And the score is meant to represent the, the quantile function of the population. So that means if you have a score of zero, then essentially all companies in your sector and in, in your um, domain are stronger than you financially based on this measurement. And if you have a score of 100, then you're the strongest company. Okay, so um, that's just kind of a, a very quick overview of what people do um, kind of historically in um, financial um, credit risk models. Um, but now um, we're just gonna um, talk a bit about alternative data and alternative methods. So I'm gonna hand over to my uh, colleague, Thanks, Adam. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, alternative data. So Adam's given a, a very good introduction to uh, the sorts of financial analysis that um, traditionally underpin credit risk. Um, and now I'm going to dive into some of the newer forms of alternative data that we're using. So first up, I guess we have to define what we mean by alternative data. Traditional data um, of the sort that Adam has been referencing is really typically numerical data, it's structured, um, and it typically is in the form of the company's financial accounts or possibly you know, the, uh, the stock prices, um, very structured and numerical data. Alternative data, which is actually a label borrowed from the uh, quantitative investment uh, funds, uh, is really um, a fairly broad term for any sort of data that doesn't fit into that description. So often this is uh, unstructured. Um, it may have very varying um, sources and may be produced over very varying timescales. And it's also uh, often not produced by the company themselves. So this might be um, sentiment data from, uh, from competitors or peers. Um, and we'll come on to some more details of that uh, shortly. So why uh, are we talking about alternative data now? Well, as we all know, um, we're in a kind of data revolution at the moment. Uh, everyone's talking about big data and um, you know, data growing at a fairly, an almost exponential rate. So over the past two years, um, more data, more information has been produced than in all history up to this point. The variety of data we're, we're trapping and recording is also growing. And hand in hand with this, we have now more uh, scalable computational power and the ability to actually store this data. Uh, if you compare what modern data capture and processing techniques are to where they were 10 or 15 years ago, or even five years ago, uh, you'll see that this has moved on at such a rapid rate that now we really have the ability to uh, look at, store and analyze data in such large volumes in comparison. And hand in hand with this, uh, we've had advances in the actual techniques that we use to process and look at this data. And this is deep learning, artificial intelligence, machine learning, a variety of techniques that people use to really try and gain insight from this huge volume of data. So just to put in perspective what we mean by big data, um, here's a few uh, kind of data points about the volumes of data being produced every minute in 2017. So you can really begin to appreciate that if, uh, you know, if there are 450,000 tweets sent a minute, uh, if there are 70,000 Netflix videos watched a minute, uh, in order to process this data, recapture this data and record this data, we need all these new technologies, but these off offer an absolute gold mine of information uh, in their domains if we are able to really harness them. Uh, so I'll hand back over to Adam to talk a bit about AI, which is really the technique driving a lot of this new insight. Uh, Adam appears not to be uh, available, so I'll, I'll carry on. Um, so yes, so as I said, um, artificial intelligence is really the the kind of engine that's driving a lot of this, uh, this new innovation. Um, a lot of this boils down to pattern recognition. Uh, so th the, the basic goal of artificial intelligence and machine learning um, is to spot patterns in data 
at a scale that we really aren't able to do as humans. Uh, Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm oh, here now. You're back. <laughs> okay, I'll hand over back over to Adam. Uh, okay, so one of the main reasons that um, alternative data uh, has started to be used today, as Phil says, is kind of the proliferation of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, so AI is essentially just really good at pattern recognition. Um, here, is, here is an example. So um, basically, this is an example of um, the, the pictures of um, the back of a healthy person's retina and um, someone who had this particular um, disease that comes, comes about um, uh, when people have diabetes. Um, essentially, if this um, particular um, problem can be um, spotted, um, it can, um, before it, it takes hold, it can stop the person going blind. And um, out of all the eye specialists that look at this, only 60% of the time could those um, people pick up this uh, particular problem. Whereas um, some AI researchers took um, 150,000 um, pictures of, of the back of uh, people's eyes and that they were able to train a, a, an AI um, algorithm to uh, pick out these, these very tiny hemorrhages which occur much better than the, um, the consultant eye uh, people ever could. Um, so um, essentially, it, AI is really good at pattern matching. Here's an example of where AI doesn't do so well. Um, so uh, this is one of Google's uh, picture recognition algorithms um, struggled to um, differentiate between whether a picture showed a sloth or a pan au chocolat. However, the main point is that if you have enough data and you put enough data into your artificial intelligence um, uh, algorithm, then essentially uh, machines at very specific tasks can be better than humans at, at these things. General artificial intelligence, which is where um, a machine can learn to do lots of different things, is probably somewhat further away. But here we're talking about doing very specific pattern recognition. Okay, um, so and also I just thought I'd share um, a quote um, from Andrew Ng, who's quite a prominent um, computer scientist in um, artificial intelligence. Um, and he's saying here that essentially there's going to be a revolution in the next few years. He's saying that just as electricity transformed almost everything 100 years ago, today he, th he feels that AI is going to do the same thing in many industries and really take hold in the next several um, years to come. And as I kind of touched upon in the, in the last slide, the reason that this um, is happening is because um, whereas with kind of traditional statistical techniques, a bit like the Z score that we were talking about earlier in the talk, um, they kind of had a plateau of performance. So the more data you threw at them, their performance would kind of come to a plateau. Whereas with um, a lot of these artificial intelligence um, algorithms at deep learning, the more data you have, and if you can throw hundreds of millions of data points at a particular thing, then it will learn and continue to learn and have greater performance. So it's kind of uh, like a, <laughs> a virtuous uh, circle really. So we collect more data and the accuracy of AI um, increases and so on, and it goes round and round. So that's kind of generally um, why AI is coming to prom prominence, but why um, and how is it different in, in credit risk? Well, essentially it isn't, it's still pattern recognition. You, you have um, some companies and you have whatever data you want to throw at them, whatever that data may be, and you, you put that into your model and the, the aim of it is to it is for your algorithm to draw some kind of decision boundary like I'm showing here. So here I'm showing blue company, uh, blue dots are meant to represent companies that maybe didn't go on to have some kind of financial distress and um, orange uh, dots here are companies that did go on to have some financial distress. And the data, the axes here, the X1, X2, X3, that could be more traditional data, things like sales or the assets of the company or the 
stocks and shares, prices, that kind of thing. Or it could be um, unstructured data, things like text or um, pictures that, we, that we've been showing here. So essentially, in credit risk, it's not any different to any other domain. Um, you've just got to put in the data. And if you have enough data, you can start to build these models and, and, um, and get good accuracy. OK, so um, that was just a bit about kind of AI and in general and how it might apply to uh, credit risk. But I'm going to hand back to my colleague to talk to you a bit about what different data types there are available. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, so we've now seen really uh, you know, what we mean by alternative data and um, how we can use you know, modern machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques to really build performant models um, to capture um, trends in credit risk. So what do we actually mean um, by types of data of credit risk? Um, so as we said, this is the traditional data is the financial data that an accountant would really be focused on. Maybe it's also market data such as share prices and more macroeconomic factors such as the stage in the economic cycle um, or any country risk uh, indicators. But alternative data might be uh, text data. Um, so this might be from social media or it could be from uh, filed documents. It can also be network data. Um, so here we're thinking about the interconnections and relationships in possibly even existing data uh, and how we can use that to assess credit risk. We're also in the age of open government and, uh, and, and, and open data. Uh, we have more and more government data sets available, whether that be VAT based information, uh, public contracts, the uh, public contracts that are tendered now have to be um, publicly released and business rates information as well. And we're also living in the world of open banking now um, and PSD2 and open banking is bringing about huge uh, increase in potentially in the volume of data that uh, credit risk um, analysts may be able to have access to. Um, it's now possible for um, credit reference agencies to request uh, that a company uh, give them access to their uh, transactional data for their current accounts and use that as a basis of credit scoring. And even more, uh, in more kind of new age, uh, we can even look at customer behavior uh, within uh, credit reference platforms, click data and web hits, these sorts of areas. So there's a huge array of um, alternative data sources and these vary in structure, they vary in time scale. And this is just a, sn a, a snapshot. I'm sure in one, two, three years, there'll be a hundred more sources of data that we haven't even thought about. Uh, so having given a brief overview of all, all those things, um, I think it's worth drilling down into a couple of those and we'll, um, we'll give you some applications of, uh, of these kind of alternative data sources and credit risk. And I'll hand back over to Adam uh, to talk about text analysis and how we can use uh, text to, insight, uh, to inform our credit models. Okay, thanks Phil. Um, okay, so... Um, just going to talk a little bit about um, language processing to analyze text. So text data can be anything. It can be news data, social media data, it could be Twitter feeds. It could be, there's various news APIs or any other kind of documents. And one of the things that we've been working on at Company Watch is um, using the kind of text or language from companies' reports, financial reports to um, predict financial distress or insolvency. So um, here's just um, a pipeline of the kind of thing that you do in this kind of modeling place um, process. So we collected um, over the last 10 or 15 years, hundreds of thousands of um, companies financial reports, which obviously contain the financial um, actual numbers, but they also contain um, all of the text, all the things that the auditors or the chairman of the company said about their company. Um, and what we've done is we've gone and extracted the text, we've cleaned up that text, maybe picked out particular keywords or phrases, and then we've exposed this to um, an artificial intelligence machine learning model and effectively trained um, that model to um, figure out um, what the kind of signs of financial distress are 
um, given the companies that we know have previously gone into, um, into some kind of insolvency event and what their people said in their um, financial reports before, um, before uh, that event. And then essentially once you've um, exposed that model to all of that data, then on a kind of single, um, going forward on a single um, uh, report at a time um, uh, level, you can um, work out what the likelihood of failure is of a particular company at that point in time from looking at the text. So here's some examples of some, of some frequent words and phrases that we found are, are potentially negative um, in, this, in this modeling process. So things like default or loans or taxation, director resignation, um, things that you might expect. The model was able to work these things out organically. And here's some positive things that may marginally increase, uh, decrease the probability of financial distress. So some more positive things like dividend or um, some positive words, profit per share, that kind of thing. Okay, and just to kind of um, go into it in a little bit more depth, here is a graph and it shows um, uh, seven words and the average number of mentions um, in some financial reports in orange where the company went on in the next one or two years to have some kind of distress or default event. And you can see, from, and, and the blue is the um, companies that didn't have some kind of distress event. And you can see that in all these cases for these seven words, um, the average number of mentions um, in the companies that went on to fail um, was higher for those companies in comparison. So we're not saying if there's a particularly one of these words in, in the financial report that that company is necessarily going to fail, but we're just trying to um, allow the um, credit analysts or the person reading the reports to be directed um, to, to the right place in the report and to find things that the artificial intelligence model found to be um, of interest or of importance to the model. Okay. So um, we built this model um, based on these um, words and phrases that occur in these financial reports. And what we find is that we have already um, the H score and the model of um, financial strength coming from the balance sheet and the profit and loss statement, the cash flow statement. And the, the model be built on the words and the text is kind of adding extra new information. So the accuracy of the two um, combined approaches using the more traditional data, but also the alternative data can add, uh, um, can add to the accuracy of your overall picture of a company um, and can um, provide extra value that you couldn't have found by just analyzing the traditional data. Okay, so now I'll just go through a couple of recent examples that um, we recently looked at using the new um, uh, text-based modeling. So this is LK Bennett, um, the, uh, a retailer um, clothes company in the UK. Um, and whilst the financial model in this case picked up um, that this um, was li uh, likely to be a problematic company from a um, credit point of view, um, the uh, text-based model um, decided that there were particular indicators that it found in the text. And these were turnaround, restructuring, cash flow forecasts, exceptional costs. And here um, I've tried to highlight some information um, from the financial report before they went into administration in March. Um, so they're talking about um, the wider challenges in the re retail sector. Um, they've got a turnaround strategy uh, and there's some exceptional costs um, that were driven by a corporate restructuring um, process that they were in. So again, it's all about kind of um, alerting the user of the system to um, the, the likely things that they would want to, um, to look at. And, and by using artificial intelligence, you can um, take away a lot of the, um, the work that is involved in reading a lot of these financial reports for, for many people. 
Another example, um, Crawshaw Butchers PLC, um, a, but, um, a butcher uh, company um, publicly listed, um, recently went into administration in November. In that financial report, before they went into administration, they were talking about um, the, the fact there was a new management team and there were issues and things that were uh, <laughs> disappointing and things like that. And one further example, a company in the US that recently went into um, Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection, actually in July 2017, the model was able to pick out that they had this credit agreement. Um, and uh, we found that the model um, that we built on the US companies, um, whenever a company had some kind of um, revolving credit facility or credit agreement um, that that was what the model was kind of alerting um, us to. Okay, so they're just um, a few examples of some of the things that we've been doing with uh, text-based analysis using um, machine learning. Um, so the message is really that um, together with traditional modeling based on financial data, um, you can um, put this together with unstructured text data and the outcome um, from this kind of process will be um, likely give you better accuracy um, and, and it will be a complementary approach to, to, to that original approach. Okay, so I'm gonna hand over to Phil to talk to you a little bit about network analysis and credit risk. Thanks Adam. Yeah, so I'm going to give another example um, of where we can use these sorts of alternative data. Um, and this is you know, slightly different, but again, uh, similar sorts of themes. So what we're talking about here is, is network analysis. And by this, I mean uh, using information about the directors and the relationships between companies uh, to really interrogate and enhance credit scoring. Uh, so here we're going beyond looking at a company in isolation. We're looking at the corporate history of its directors and also the financial strength of any connected companies. And this concept of looking at the relationships and connections rather than just the individual uh, uh, data about the company uh, is not necessarily new and we're not necessarily using new information. We're just analyzing that information in a different way and we're doing it on a different scale. And I'll come back to what I mean by that shortly. This is particularly valuable when we're thinking of uh, companies that have quite limited traditional information or you know, raw financial information. Uh, and I'll give some examples of why that might be shortly. Uh, so you might think that a director, for example, that's been involved in insolvency in the past might have a higher risk of being involved with failures in the future. So if a new company, Company D, was founded, uh, of which director one was a new director, uh, this newly incorporated company might be a more risky proposition um, to extend credit to because we know in the past director one has been associated with this failed company, Company A. I've represented in red here. And again, that's particularly powerful when we have a newly incorporated company where we don't have any financial data yet. This effect might even extend through co-directors. So you can imagine a situation where uh, a company that's actually a couple of stages removed from a failure. So here we have company A that failed. Um, a newly, newly incorporated company E is related indirectly to company A. And there may be a higher chance of failure even in this case. So the protocol here for, uh, for analyzing the credit risk of a newly incorporated company might be to get the credit scores of all related companies based on the directors, build up a profile for each of those directors that might be involved with the new company, and then assess the risk based on that corporate history of each director, um, particularly any insolvencies or failures in the past, um, but it could be other data about the companies that are in the history of that director as well. <clears throat> Approaches like this really rely on the fact that we have you know, accurate recording of the connections or the directorships details um, for companies. And I'll come back to that in a detail in, uh, shortly. Um, but it also relies very heavily on being able to analyze very large volumes of data and look at the connections across the whole population to be able to draw statistically relevant uh, conclusions. And analyzing data at this kind of volume and this scale requires both new data analysis and handling techniques, and also innovative new uh, 
uh, algorithms and machine learning approaches. So this really is partly a problem of scale. Um, we know that in the UK, companies house reports officer information for each company, um, but it's not able um, purely through you know, bandwidth of, of human resource available to extensively check and rationalize director profiles. The result of this is that there are many matching, uh, many multiple uh, directorship profiles for a given individual. And in order to process the data in this sort of network uh, relationship fashion, we really need to deduplicate these records so that we have uh, an idea of the same individual and give them um, you know, multiple, link up multiple records. This is a fairly large undertaking. Uh, there are 16 million unique officers registered at Companies House. Nine million of those are related to the four million or so live companies. So you can see that the scale here is quite different uh, to, to that of, uh, of just traditional financial data uh, where we're only considering companies in isolation. Often if we just look through the Companies House system, we may be able to see duplicates ourselves so here is um, one of the founders of Company Watch. Uh, he has two profiles on, on Company's House, and that's simply because there's a misspelling in the name of the, uh, of the address of the company. Um, while it might be easy to spot duplicates on a case-by-case -case basis, when there are 16 million uh, unique officers to compare, a manual approach like this is just obviously not scalable. Uh, we'd have to carry out 256 trillion matching pairs to find duplicate directors. And so we have to use state-of-the-art um, data processing, uh, big data processing and machine learning techniques to find these potential duplicates, carry out this data validation and data cleansing, and really um, resolve you know, this large number of, of profiles down into individuals. Uh, we've used this algorithm, an algorithm we've, we've, we've developed um, to get a matching confidence between all pairs of officers. And this gives us about 4.3 million matches with a confidence of 90% or higher. And given that there are 16 million officers, you can see that if a quarter of these are actually duplicated, this has a big impact on that network or connectivity analysis. So an example where this is relevant to uh, credit risk is in um, the, the practice of phoenixing. Phoenixing is where um, unscrupulous uh, directors use bankruptcy proceedings and bankruptcy process um, to avoid repaying their creditors. And then they strip the assets from a company and start trading again under a new name. This is unfortunately quite common in the UK and it's very, very costly um, to creditors and lenders, but it's actually quite hard to detect and then prosecute um, for the authorities uh, be just because of the volume of companies they have to track. If we use our matching algorithm and connectivity in the director network, we can try and identify suspicious patterns of behavior and these duplicate director records. And this might help identify cases of phoenixism and therefore identify or flag up to our, uh, our potential customers uh, any high risk credit applications they might receive. And just a really uh, kind of simple example of that, we've got an article here from The Guardian from a couple of years ago um, about a, uh, a conservatory company, uh, IEO Home Improvements, um, based in uh, based in Kent, and they um, went through this practice of phoenixing several times. Uh, the owner, Luke Tester, who's now been um, disbarred from uh, directing companies, uh, he he was doing this process of uh, stripping assets and starting again. And if we look at his um, directorship network in the raw company house data, uh, we can see Luke Tester in the middle here. He is connected to four companies, and one of these is the failed IEO home improvements that he declared bankrupt before moving on to another company. However, there are actually five loop testers registered at Companies House, and this match, the matching algorithm I mentioned earlier, has identified and picked up five, his five different profiles, and we see now there are additional companies that are connected to this failure, and it enhances our view of this uh, suspicious business pattern um, that we might be able to see. In the data and in our, our new system that we've we've implemented uh, we can see this this exact process happening um, we've matched against uh, these other loop testers and we can pick up the fact that he's been disqualified and also that there are several companies uh, that weren't just connected to the single profile at companies else 
So that's just a very simple toy example um, of another application of, uh, of alternative data and at risk. So really the summary and the, the bottom line here is that we can use machine learning and AI um, to build pattern recognition algorithms that are far uh, more performant than humans purely because or largely because of the volume of data that we can expose these systems to. This is very scalable. We can throw more and more data and more and more sorts of data, alternative data and traditional financial data at these sorts of models. And if we collect enough of this data, then the AI models can become far more accurate than we could ever achieve uh, as an individual human. <clears throat> so thank you very much for your time. And uh, we'd like to take questions if there are any. Yep, there are, Phil. Um, we actually have a couple, I think. Um, uh, one was to Peter O'Reilly. Are you, are you guys good to share the pre this presentation as ever a great forum? So thank you very much for that, Peter. Yes, the uh, the uh, slides will be available in the next couple of days on the web on the website. Um, there's also another one from I think that's Matt Chapman. I think it's got Matt Chap up here. Uh, does the AI allow you to highlight failed businesses at same addresses? Also, could you highlight if a, a large number of independent businesses use the same address, registered address? Sure, I can answer that one. Um, yeah, so uh, that's a good question, Matt. Um, thanks very much. Yeah, so the AI um, procedure we're taking here does highlight these sorts of things. And actually, you find some very interesting and, and quite surprising patterns um, that, that come out when you do this kind of scaled um, scaled analysis of the data. Certainly you often find these patterns of, of failed businesses linked to a particular address um, and also a large number of businesses may be registered at the same address. Now this could correspond particularly to company formation companies um, and that is it can be you know, a, an indicator of, of potentially higher credit risk um, but it may, may not may not be in, in, on its own um, you know the nail that um, the final nail in the coffin, but uh, it's just another piece of data that goes into uh, these sorts of systems. And that means you can build up a broader array of, of, of metrics, um, be that the traditional financial score tied to some kind of text analysis and sentiment analysis. And then also maybe you're flagging up the fact that, hang on, this company uh, is actually registered at a business address that's had several failures in the past. You get a much more holistic uh, viewpoint of a company's um, financial health and thus credit risk and yeah it's only it's it's, it's certainly very very valuable for that uh, I think there may be another question uh, Laurie uh, I think we've got a question from uh, Eddie Younger, uh, does it define uh, directors that may be the same name being a different person? Uh, so yeah, again, it's 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 a difficult process to um, to develop these robust algorithms to try and identify um, and, you know, individuals from multiple profiles. Um, more you, you, well, the name is one one feature that we use here, but we also use other features related to the, the sorts of companies that they're related to and the patterns of business that they do and also things like addresses um, and those. So it's, it's again, it's using multiple different uh, features to try and uh, to predict how, how likely two profiles are to be the same person. Um, you know, having the same name is, is a strong indicator that you're likely to be the same person or having a very similar name. Um, but obviously it's not enough in itself because you know, John Smith could be hundreds of different people. So you have to take a number of different pieces of information in order to um, to, to improve the accuracy of your model there. I know Eddie, actually he's, he's joining us from Dallas in Texas. So uh, 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 there's also Peter O'Reilly said, fabulous, great, great job guys. So uh, thank you very much indeed, Peter. Uh, just one final question I have here. Uh, where do you see credit risk scoring in five years time?
Shall I take this one, Phil? <laughs> <laughs> it went very quiet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, essentially, there's, there's lots of different data sources um, that will become available. <laughs> so we briefly touched upon um, the government are opening up more on, on different data sets. Um, so that's going to be one factor. Um, there probably will be more data around that companies collect. Um, as you said, I think there's more data now collected in the last two years than at any other point in human history. Um, I think, so there will be lots more of data driven modeling. Um, the problem slightly with artificial intelligence is that um, it's quite difficult to figure out what's going on behind the scenes. It can quite often be a black box kind of um, modeling process. Uh, so uh, there's quite a lot of work in the interpretability of, of artificial intelligence at the moment. Um, and that's about um, trying to get human interpretation of what a particular machine learning algorithm is saying. So I think there'll be more on that front, um, especially in um, particular industries where there's a lot of um, compliance related issues. Um, and yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think so more data, <laughs> more interpretability, hopefully. Yeah, I think it's also worth saying as well that, uh, that we're not here. Um, this isn't kind of, um, you know, we're not prophets of doom here. We're not saying that, uh, that credit analysts are about to be replaced by um, by your laptop. Um, these sorts of machine learning models are very powerful, um, but one of the key uh, key purposes here isn't to replace credit analysts. It's to enhance what they're doing and really focus their attention. Um, what these models are doing is, you know, they're making uh, they may be able to make a lot of very easy decisions that might take up human time. Um, and allow in freeing up credit analysts and um, and you know, and accountants and, and others to do real deep dive work on on problem cases or cases near the boundary where it's not so clear. So the, a lot of the value here is is freeing up individuals and focusing individuals' um, attention on those cases that are surprising, unusual, and uh, and worthy of of a kind of human's intuition. Um, the machine isn't going to be able to replace that, but what it can do is is free free you up to do more of the interesting work by taking away a lot of that drudge work. So that's that's really a kind of uplifting uh, uplifting thing for uh, for these sorts of alternative data sources. Well, I don't think there's any more questions. So I'd I'd like to uh, just a big thank you to Dr. Adam and Dr. Philip, also to Company Watch. Uh, for the webinar today. Uh, also, thank you very much to everybody that joined us. I hope you found it interesting. Um, as we said earlier, this is being recorded and there will be a, a copy of it available in the next couple of days uh, on the Forums International website and hopefully Company Watch's website.